Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. We now have the entire Snowden section here. I like that. <laughs> Absolutely. When you can take up an entire row, you have, you have made it. So welcome. Thomas, happy birthday. Thank you. Hey. Happy 21st birthday. Yeah. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Nobody here believes that anyway. Yeah. No problem. Uh, uh, don't, don't listen to a word I say, okay? But seriously, today we're going to talk about something that is a little unusual in church. We're going to start. There you go. We're going to, we're going to start today talking about. What does it mean to be a Christian when we are involved in public life? In other words, what does it mean to be a Christian in terms of the affairs of this nation, the affairs of the world? Now, I start out by telling you I am not going to tell anyone who to vote for. This is not about partisanship. It's not about elections. It's not about a candidate. It is very simply about this basic question. When God created humanity in God's image, God gave humanity a very particular purpose. God said, and we're going to hear today in the book of Genesis, God said, I will create humanity in my image, and they shall have dominion over the earth. And sometimes we read that in a very narrow focus. We read that only to say, well, that means we have to take care of the environment, which we do. We read that to say, well, we need to care for, for animals and all of those things like St. Francis, and we do. It means far more than that. It means that we are to... Build God's kingdom in this world. <coughs> and sometimes we misinterpret the ministry of Jesus, and we believe that Jesus was actually what would have been called a zealot at the time, a revolutionary whose goal was to overturn the Roman government, whose goal was to overturn what they call the client kings. And while Jesus indeed was in opposition to Rome, in opposition to the client kings, he was not here as a political rival. He was here to reveal the kingdom of God. And imagine how radical that word is. Today we hear that word kingdom in scripture and we think of it as an anachronism, something from ancient days or something we see in the royalty in, in England or elsewhere. But indeed, he was saying the true kingdom is God's kingdom. The true leadership is God's leadership. And the true vision of that kingdom is what Jesus revealed. And he revealed it by walking right into the midst of humanity. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Because the real question <coughs> that God could ask us goes back to that verse in Genesis, goes back to that verse in the garden, no matter how we understand creation. The question that God is going to ask us all someday is how well did you tend that garden? How well did you tend that garden of my creation? Would you allow that garden to be overgrown with weeds of injustice and persecution, envy? Did you allow that garden to be overgrown with your own aspirations, with your own desire to get ahead? Did you allow that garden to be overgrown because you ignored the call that I placed on the heart of this very church to tend to my garden and tend it well. And we will talk about that today. But as we gather, it is important that we remember one important, one important thing this morning. And that is that this is the day that the Lord has made. Let, Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, we do have a couple of announcements. Immediately following the service today, there's going to be a very brief uh, church council meeting. Uh, we have charge conference coming up, and there's some charge conference items we need to deal with. And I'm going to ask everyone on church council who is available to attend charge conference. I spent the <coughs> afternoon with Dr. Marty, Dr. Marty Lundy, our conference superintendent, yesterday. I was with her in Gary. And the reality is, there's a message that I want everyone to hear at Charge Conference. And that message is going to resonate, I can tell you that right now. And so if you are in town next Saturday at 3.30 at Church of Four Seasons, I'm asking every council member and every member of this congregation to attend. It will be from 3.30, it will run probably to about 4.45 at Church of Four Seasons. I also need 
one or two people who would be willing to help with the logistics on that day, and that is standing behind a table as people register, and also selling our t-shirts, our Stronger Together t-shirts. Uh, so anyone I need, I need a couple volunteers for that. And in addition, in addition, I do need two people, one, two, three, how many people, who would be willing to be part of our song leaders? You're not gonna be singing a song independently, but we're going to have community singing. We're going to have community singing at the event, and we want to have some folks leading that singing. We're gonna be doing two songs, uh, very simple songs, but songs it's important that we have people leading the congregation. So if anyone's willing to do that, please see me after the service today. Are there any other announcements? That was easy. All right, there being none, as we walked into the church today, we all walked in with our own concerns, our own burdens, the things we're dealing with in life. But when we come into this place, and I mean this very seriously, we want to feel the love of Christ. And what that truly means is that as we greet one another, we are greeting one another offering that love offering that unconditional love to one another. You know, I can guarantee you, I know everybody in this congregation, most of you extremely well, I can guarantee you that no two people are gonna agree on everything. I can guarantee that. We agree on one thing, Jesus Christ is Lord, and we are called to live with that promise in our heart. So let's share with one another now a sign of Christ's love and Christ's peace. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Now don't we all feel better? <laughs> all right. Uh, now let us see about the reason we've gathered on this day that God has gifted unto us as we join in our call to worship. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. Require of you to act justly and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. You know what? I need a bulletin. Oh. Here you go. Here. I was looking at last week. <laughs> and while it was a good service last week. <laughs> All right, please join us in our opening hymn, Trust and Obey. That's on page 467, verses 1, 2, and 3 with an introduction. <coughs>
this is the time when we are called to talk about God's presence in our life, and we know that God is present in every moment of our life. But there are times we want to testify to that. We want to testify to that not for our own well-being, but we want to testify to that to reveal God's love to other people. That's really what it's all about. And as we lift up those things on our heart that are heavy, those people in our families, our extended families, our community, our world, that are suffering, we, we lift them up not to tell God what to do, but to recognize we have the assurance that God is present within each moment of suffering as well as each moment of joy. And so today, we do not have a particular designation for our sanctuary light. So what I'm going to ask us to think about today as we look at the sanctuary light, the light that burns eternally, let's think about the people who built this church. Many of you have relatives who built this congregation. Many of you came here because of marriage. Some were baptized here. But think about all of the people who filled these seats in those pews across the street. Let their light be our light. Let their hope be our hope. And let their perseverance be our perseverance. You know, the reading from 1 Corinthians we call the love reading, chapter 13. There's this great line, and sometimes we forget it. And it says that love always hopes. Love always trusts in God. Love always protects, and love always perseveres. And the people who built Salem United Methodist Church, beginning with the first Methodist pastor in 1864, those people all are responsible for protecting, for trusting, for hoping, and for persevering. And as we look at that light today, may their light never be dimmed or diminished by death, and may we carry their light forward. Also today, I want to thank all of you for the, the prayers and kind wishes for Roxanne. She is home and doing well. We appreciate that. Uh, certainly, she's very much appreciative of everyone reaching out to her and uh, being present to her and, che and checking on her. Uh, we really want to thank uh, Peggy for the gift of bubble wrap. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she thought, she thought I got her a nice present become very handsomely wrapped. Oh, one size fits all. That was, a bit, that was a bit of a letdown when she opened it, but nonetheless, that's all right. And Elaine, we're so happy you're doing well. Yes. You're making a great recovery, and that's awesome. We're so glad you're here today. Thank you. Um, anyone else? To, and Judy, welcome back. We're glad hey. you made it through hey. surgery. Hey. I mean, it wasn't a standing Woo. ovation, Woo. but I mean, there were, a, there were, there were what did you count it? Two people? I think so. <laughs> oh, it was two, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. And we want to pray for anyone in this congregation who's dealing with a difficult time right now, wherever they may be. I still, we still need to pray for the Polaric family after that horrible tragedy. Tragedies like that are deep scars. And we want to pray for them and just, just hold them in your hearts. That's so important. Any other, any other joys or can Yes, Peggy. And Tammy went the third and had her PET scan, so I need prayers that she gets good results and it has, cancer hasn't grown. We she will do that. Certainly, and to Chris as well. Yeah, she goes in the tenth for five more days of treatment. Right. We will uh, certainly pray for that. Yes. Uh, tomorrow and Tuesday, I'm having uh, phone uh, conversations with the doctor. Okay. And hopefully, they can give me results of uh, the test on the lip node. Very good. I'll pray for a good outcome with that. All right. Anyone else? Yes, Mary. Okay. I just, with all that's gone on in North Carolina, the whole thing, the Nazarene Church of Alpha is taking a semi truck. Mm -hmm down there. In fact, they're going to take two. But they're leaving, I think it's either, I think it was Tuesday morning. Mm -hmm. And they're collecting toilet paper, water, whatever people would like to donate. So, if anybody's interested. It's kind of late for this one, but I'll find out when the next truck goes. Where's That's, the drop-off at the yeah, church? Yeah, what is the drop-off? Right at the church, yeah. Which Nazarene church in Belleville? On the corner of Glendale and Sylvavie. 
Oh, okay. It's like 2702 Glendale. Okay. So that's where all the taller people went. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. And I think that shows God's hand at work. Yeah. You know, even in the midst of, of a struggle. Thank you, Mary. Yes, Richie. Yeah, oh yes. Uh, it's only paid for my from the text of the name and uh, and my and my gamma all of these and my and my and jewelry. Chuck Breach or so, um, my other drama, Dumb and Ennis, she had a very big Monosome birthday. She turned, uh, she, she, she turned 95. Wow. And, and, and also, um, October, uh, October 19th, um, that'd be the, the day when my sister. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Now, pray for your sister, your cousin, your grandmas. That's yeah. great. Thank yeah. you. Very good. Awesome. Yes, John. Bruce wrote a Montemir family. Okay. Worked with his mother back. Oh, really? What's the name? Montemir. Montemir? Okay. She's 100, 104. Oh, my goodness. Wow. We will do that. Anyone else this morning? Yes, Adam. Um, prayers for my cousin Bertha. Uh, we married her the other day. Okay. Uh, she was uh, she was just maybe a week or two uh, younger than I was. Okay. What is that? Bertha. Mm -hmm. Can't remember. What? Ber Ber Berka. Berka. Uh, yeah, I didn't think it. That's why. That's why I said. Spanish. I said the English. Erica. We'll pray for Erica's family. Thank you. Uh, anyone else this morning? All right. Let us center ourselves in the presence of a God who walks each and every human journey. Holy God, we know many times this human journey can be difficult. But yet it is a journey that you walked embodied in your Son as your Spirit walked among us as the person of Jesus, the one we now call the Christ. But he walked that very human journey, and as we come to you today, we lift on to you our joys and our burdens. We know that everything that we have endured or ever will endure was endured by your Son, and so you, you are with the human experience. You cause us within that experience to glorify your name, and we, we pray today in a very special way for Tammy, for your continued healing presence to grant her peace and strength. We pray for good test results this week, and we pray for Chris as well. May you strengthen Chris and his ability to be present to Tammy and support her. And may Tammy know a hope not born of circumstance, but born only of your faithfulness. We pray for Elaine as she awaits these test results. We know that that can be anxiety producing. We pray that you will grant her a certain and a real peace and a presence and a trust that you are in charge. May she feel comforted, comforted by, by your embrace. We pray for all who are victims of the hurricanes and tropical storms. We thank you that through the church of your son that we are, people are rising up in acts of compassion, acts of generosity. Open each of our hearts and the hearts of this entire congregation as to how we may serve and be part of that great ministry and mission to those, to those who are in need. Uh, we pray for Bertus family as they walk this uh, they walk this journey of grief. May they be comforted by the legacy of a life lived well, and may they find great hope in the promise, in, in the promise of the empty tomb. We pray for the Montemir family as they, as they mourn their loss. In their grief, grant them hope. But in their grief, may they remember these words from scripture that you are close to the brokenhearted and you save those crushed in spirit. May they know that you hear their cries and you walk this journey of grief with them in so many, many different ways. We pray in thanksgiving for, for Judy's recovery. We'll pray you continue to sustain her. 
We thank you for Roxanne's recovery, and again, may she feel your healing presence and, and walk with her in very, very special ways. We pray again for the Polaric family as they deal with this tragedy. There are things in life, Father, we simply don't understand. But we pray now that your grace may be upon them in ways that heal, in ways that comfort. We pray for, for Richie's cousins, sister, his grandmas, that they may all know your love, your peace, your hope. We thank you for the witness. We thank you for the ministry of their lives. We pray for all we now raise unto you. We thank you for the ability to speak with you, to be welcomed into your world. We pray that as we go forward from this day, that we may truly be the hands and the feet of your Son. For all we have prayed for, may we, by the power of your Spirit, be present to them, guiding them, sustaining them, offering your love. We pray this in the name of the one who perfects our faith, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of confession found in your bulletin. Holy God, your, your Son, Son, our Lord, came to proclaim your kingdom for all people for all time. In him, the glory of your grace was revealed, and we were invited to share your reconciling love. Yet we often forsake your pathways. Our hope is in the passing and the transient of this world. You are a merciful God. Forgive us for failing to live as bearers of your kingdom's message. Cause us to be instruments of your mercy and witnesses of the good news of your Son, our Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. We now enter into this time of stillness. And it's a time when we are called in a particular way to experience God. And I say this most weeks, stillness is the first prayer. I think if you look at the prayers of Jesus, and they record 25 different times in the Gospels alone that Jesus prayed. Now we know there are countless more times. But each of those times, we notice that uh, other than on just a limited number of occasions, we have no idea what he said. Because he was silent in the presence of his Father. He waited for an answer in prayer. He did not presume, prejudge, or assume. And as we center ourselves today in stillness to experience the fullness of God, absent those distractions of our lives, absent those distractions of the world, I would like us to concentrate, just concentrate on one word. That word is kingdom. Don't think about it. Don't evoke any particular images of kings or queens or dynasties. But just put that word in your heart and let God speak into your life what that means today in your life, in your world, in this congregation. Amen. Amen. And what I'm hoping this month we can all concentrate on is what that word really means to all of us. How we interpret it, how we live it, what it means to say we are citizens of God's kingdom, first and foremost. And that as citizens of God's kingdom, we are called to a particular role in public life. 
particular role is the Church of Jesus Christ. And it does not have to be an either or. It does not have to mean I can be involved in public life or I can be a Christian. It means that I can be a Christian and be involved in public life. For every great, every great movement of human rights has started within the body of Christ. Every great movement of human rights. Let us never forget that. We now enter into prayers of the people at that time and we are reminded of that very thing, that we are the body of Christ. Please respond, hear our prayer. God, your grace is abundant, your mercy unending, and as we gather today, we lift these prayers unto you, full of confidence through your Son. May the church of your Son be a beacon of light in darkness, a place of hope for those who despair, and a sanctuary for those who seek peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For this local congregation, Salem United Methodist Church, entering our 181st year of gospel-centered witness, may we continue to be a place of fellowship, a place of service with love, and a place of hope, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all who grieve, that they may be comforted by your promising words that you are close to those who mourn, and save the crushed in spirit, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For those who suffer, those on the road to recovery to know strength, those awaiting test results to know hope, and those awaiting a diagnosis to know that your peace abides with them, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For the victims of the recent hurricanes and tropical storms, that they may see your hand at work through acts of compassion. May the first responders know the protection of your love, and may there be a hope born out of this disaster that testifies to your people, revealing your kingdom, revealing your love, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For those who suffer emotionally, those who suffer the bondage of addiction, that the church of your son may be a place of hope, a place of service, and most of all, a place of love. And for those desires, those burdens, and those joys residing in the depths of our hearts and the depths of our soul, where there is despair, grant peace. Where there is doubt, grant hope. Where there is fear, may they know your love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, our Lord, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. We bring forward our gifts. Please stand for the doxology. reconciling love through your son we offer the labors of our hands the words of our lips as well in the work of building your kingdom on this earth lead us to those who are persecuted those who are treated unfairly those who fear so that they may know your reconciling love and we may testify to the glory of your son and it is in his name we pray amen amen, amen. amen. This morning's Old Testament reading comes from Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 through 26. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, 
and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. Uh, please stand as you are able. This morning's gospel reading comes from John chapter 18, verses 35 through 38. Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and the chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is far from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king? In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there, and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. When I decided to do a preaching series on how Christians are involved in public life, I have to admit I had a little trepidation because pastors can easily get off track when you're talking about that. It's very easy for a pastor to seem partisan, very easy for a pastor to say, well, I support one political party or another. So I start, I start with those great words of my Aunt Jean, who fully believed that God is a Republican. She had no doubt in her mind that God's a Republican. She once told me she had a vision, and she saw Jesus Christ wearing a very gold water button in 1964. <laughs> now, she absolutely, totally believed that, that Republicans were a favored group with God. Now, my Uncle Bob was a Democrat. <coughs> Democrat for his entire life. His family was very much involved in Democratic politics. But that was not the reason he was going to hell. He was going to hell because he went to the bowling alley. So, <laughs> but isn't it funny how we make those assumptions? Isn't it funny how, because I, I know people as well who fully believe that God was a Democrat. But the reality is, that's not our goal in talking about how to be a Christian in the secular world. And that's where we live, when you think about it, we spend an hour, an hour a week in, this, in church. An hour a week in church, but you know what? Where do we spend the rest of our time? We spend the rest of our time in the world. We spend the rest of our time in the world. And I started out today talking about God asking us, how well do you tend the garden? Think about that reading that Ed did from Genesis. And often we just read right through that because we're getting up to the big catastrophe. We're going to eat the forbidden fruit in just a, a few passages after that. And we forget, what did God say? God said, let us make humankind in our image, and they will have dominion. And not just dominion over a few animals, not just dominion over plants and trees, but dominion over God's creation. And dominion relates to a very special relationship. It's a relationship that is first built on love for that creation, love for that garden, as the metaphor for God's creation. I had a good friend in seminary, and he was an excellent seminary student, and I can recall he gave a sermon one time on that very text from Genesis. And he told the story of how when he was just a student pastor, when he was a student pastor, he, he, he would visit his grandparents' house. And in the backyard of his grandparents' house, they had, this, they had this beautiful garden. 
And right in the center of the garden, there was this pond. And uh, it was just a wonderful place to go with flowers and plants and trees of all kinds. And his grandfather would tend it meticulously. And he said when he was growing up, he can remember as a little boy how he would sit in that garden. And his grandfather would say, you know, everything we plant now, everything I tend this year is going to appear to die. It's going to appear to go away. And all of a sudden, you know, you look out here in winter and it's going to be snow covered. And all those bright, beautiful flowers that you see right now, they're going to be gone. And all those trees flowering and the ones that have fruit in them, they're not going to be beautiful anymore. They're going to be bare and they're going to stand against a cold sky. And he said his grandfather would use that as a metaphor for how life can be, that there is always going to be this resurrection. Well, his grandfather died, as the story goes, and his his grandmother, getting up in years, had to go in assisted living. And he had the ability, the family gave him the right to live in that house when he was starting out as a pastor. And he said when he had his first appointment, even though he's still in seminary, he was living in that house, and it was a small congregation, only about 25 miles from the house. So he was able to live there, and he said he would go home, and he would tend that garden. He would tend that garden every day and he would make sure that no weeds were growing up and he would trim the bushes and he would make sure the flowers had everything they needed and it, it became a beautiful garden and he tended it. He took care of it. But then he got an appointment to a larger church. He got an appointment to go off and be an associate pastor as often we do before we become a senior pastor. He got an appointment at a large church. His time to tend the garden became less and less and less. And the garden began to be overcome with weeds. The garden began to fall into disrepair, almost disregard. But every time he said he would go to visit his grandmother at the assisted living at the nursing home, she would say, are you tending grandpa's garden? Are you taking care of that garden? And he would somewhat shamelessly told her, yes, I'm taking care of it. Well, he finally got to be a senior pastor. He finally got to be the senior pastor of one of our largest churches in the Indiana Conference. He moved into a nice parsonage not far from that church. A parsonage that had a grounds crew to take care of the lawn, take care of the gardens around the church. He didn't have to worry about that anymore. And so that house sat vacant, that garden sat vacant. And then his grandmother passed away. After a long, long journey of illness, his grandmother passed away. And he said as he was traveling back to this area to do her funeral, he went to that house, been, been unoccupied since he was there as a young associate. And he made sure that garden looked good. He made sure that garden looked good, and he cleaned it up to the best of his ability. He even tried to plant some flowers that were already blooming. He did the best he could, and, I, and he said, you know, and a lot of people ask me why. They said that house will probably be torn down. That house will probably be either that or just rented out for time immemorial. He said, because I know my grandma's in heaven, and she's looking down at me, and she's saying, he tended that garden well. The bottom line is God is looking at us saying the same thing. How are we tending that garden of God's creation? How are we tending what we are called to do? We are called, and isn't it very interesting, in the Indiana Conference, our, our motto this year, our mantra this year, is cultivate joy. Isn't it interesting we use the word cultivate? Because that's what God calls us to do in God's creation. Are we cultivating joy in everything we do? For you see, God has called us to have dominion. God has called us to care for this world. God has called us not only to be good people, God has called us to be the good in the world, to care for God's garden. So when God says to us, how did you tend to my garden? Can we say we tended your garden with love? And oh, there were weeds growing up in there. There were weeds of injustice. There were weeds of persecution. And you know what? Sometimes those weeds of hate even began to overtake your creation. 
There were weeds growing up a disregard for humanity. There were weeds growing up of people who didn't care for one another. But you know what? You know what? We tried to tend it, and did you tend it? God will say to us, did you tend it with love? And indeed, we might answer, how was I supposed to do that? In all of your creation? How was I supposed to take care of all of your creation? And God would say, I didn't ask you to take care of all of your creation. I ask you to take care of one flower, one person. I ask you to take care of maybe one person who is being covered by those weeds. I ask you to take care of one shrub, maybe one family that was in despair. That's all I ask you to take care of. That's what you're called to do as you're called to tend God's garden. But here's the beautiful part of that. You're not called to tend that garden alone. We are called to tend that garden in community. And we are called to tend that garden as the church of Jesus Christ. And the more we recognize that, and we also need to recognize we tend that garden with the power, the inspiration, and the hope that is the Holy Spirit. God didn't say, here, the world is all yours. I'm going away. God said, no. You have dominion over this world, but you're not going to take a step that I'm not there by my spirit. You're not going to turn one spade to cultivate joy without the Holy Spirit holding that shovel in your hand. You're not going to reach out to one flower that seems to be dying and engulfed by weeds without my Holy Spirit telling you how to bring it back to life. Oh, God, God asks us to tend the garden of creation, but not to tend it alone. And so my message today, my friends, ask yourself that question this week. How am I tending God's garden? Am I tending that garden with love? Or am I turning my eyes to the weeds and the overgrowth? Am I tending that garden with hope? Or am I walking amid it, not even noticing the loss of a flower, the death of a plant? Am I tending that garden as a place that reveals God's love to all the world? And if I am, by the power of God's spirit, then I'm building God's kingdom in this world, and I'm tending God's garden. Let us pray. Holy God, you call us to tend the garden of all creation, the great creation that you have given us, the beauty of the human spirit joined with your spirit, the beauty of hope born of your Holy Spirit, the beauty of love by which we are called to live, all of those things are used to build your kingdom. We pray now by the power of your Holy Spirit that you will guide each person gathered here today, that we may continue to tend your garden, to tend your garden so it becomes the true reflection of your love, the true reflection of your creation, and the true reflection of your grace. We pray this in your son's blessed name. Amen. Amen. As we tend that garden, we need nourishment along the way. That nourishment is God's grace. And as we gather at this table, three very important things are taking place. First, we recognize that we are one. All differences stop as we approach this table. 